Hello, I'm David Bulo, Director of Educational Programs at Performance, the online community for corporate finance, accounting, treasury, and related professionals. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, Leverage the Power of the Cloud. As your business is growing, acquiring businesses, adding, adding subsidiaries, and conducting transactions in multiple currencies, managing your business can easily become unduly burdened as you see little visibility into the process. Learn how you can have real-time visibility, improve controls, and become more efficient through moving to the cloud. A few items before we get started. I would like to thank NetSuite for helping us make this event possible and their generous support, for which helps us deliver this webinar at no cost. For those who are returning, thank you. For those who are new, welcome. Performative is the fastest growing online resource for senior level corporate finance, treasury, and accounting professionals. We provide a uniquely valuable online peer network which provides direct subject matter expert advice. We are an ad-free, noise-free community where we encourage and expect peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. Check it out at performative.com. The link to this presentation and the recording of this event will be sent out to all attendees within 24 hours. If you would like the current presentation to follow along, it is already posted on performance.com slash resources for you to download. In order to qualify for CPE, you must also answer all three polling questions, and you need to have pre-registered for CPE. If you have any questions around CPE, please contact Chris Bauer at CPE. Please contact Chris Bauer at CPE at performative.com. We encourage you to ask questions by using the question box in the GoToWebinar panel. We will do our best to have them answered. If we do not get to your question, we will forward them to today's speakers so they can answer them directly. You'll be asked to take a short, less than one minute survey at the end of the presentation. Please give us your feedback so we can bring you the best content possible and continue to improve. Now for today's learning objectives. In attending this webinar, you will learn how you can manage global business more efficiently in the cloud. A panel of finance professionals will share best practices and insights on how they successfully moved to the cloud, gaining efficiencies in managing your financial close process and meeting compliance requirements. Now it is great pleasure to introduce our speaker and panelist of today. Our speaker today is Ben King. Ben is a senior product marketing manager at NetSuite and has prior work experience in both the software industry and professional services. Prior to NetSuite, Ben performed product marketing for Oracle Corporation, supporting software sales and corporate finance modeling, and planning products to companies around the world. Prior to working in the software industry, Ben worked as a consultant and accountant at Deloitte, where he earned a CPA while serving the financial service industry. He held an MBA from Northwestern University and a BS in business administration from the University of California, Berkeley. Our first of two panelists, John Correa, John is CFO of Healing Waters International and has served with the organization for two years. John has over 25 years of experience in both business operations and financial management. His career in includes roles as CFO, Vice President and General Manager, Controller and Direct Financial an Analyst in various companies. Much of his career has focused in the water treatment industry. John has his bachelor's degree and also his MBA. Our second panelist, Stephanie Zamora. Stephanie is a Silicon Valley native and seasoned startup veteran, initiating finance functions and ERP system architectures for technology companies in various verticals. Currently, Stephanie is the CFO of Horton Works, Inc., where she has laid the accounting foundation to handle accelerated growth and complexity as a major player in the big data space. Previously, she was key contributor of architecture and factory reporting capabilities as manufacturing finance manager at a high volume solar manufacturing company. Prior, Stephanie was VP of finance and founding member of Neoconics, launching a new semiconductor technology venture. It is now a great pleasure. I turn it over to Ben. Thank you, David. 
So for the remainder of the session, I will be spending a few moments talking about some of the business challenges that we're seeing in the market and how they're impacting finance and accounting departments. And then I'll move on to talking about what exactly is the power of the cloud. And then we'll move on to the panel discussion. So one of the challenges when it comes to the things that we're seeing finance and accounting departments facing has to do with growth. And if you look at this quote, which I located in a study done by McKinsey a couple years ago, it's talking about businesses trying to grow and processes that come under stress. And particularly processes that come under stress when they get overlooked. And when we think about unscalable processes that are under stress, we often think of this really as an internal challenge because you think of all the people involved in your organizations, all the people in your departments who are trying to cope with this. And then if you look at the slide title, is your company prepared for growth? In some ways, it almost sounds a little too perfect. It sounds like that there's some kind of pre-growth staging area for you to go to and set up all the pieces and get everything ready right before you go out and grow. But the reality is we're always in the middle of growth, we're always in the middle of change, and we're trying to manage it. There isn't a chance to pause, stop, think about it, and then move forward at your convenience. I recently heard a story from someone in our finance department who says that when they do their annual three-year plan for the board, they not only think about revenues and profitability in the future, but also what it will do to the company three years from now. So given the expected size of the company with those projections, how many employees will that be? How many monthly paychecks will that be? How many expense reports? How many customers will there be? How many professional services projects will be running? Finance looks at all those metrics, the resulting processes, as well as the way processes are currently done. And for some of those processes, some will stay in place and scale, if example, we just add another two guys to that process. But others, on the other hand, really need to be examined from where the process is today and where it needs to be. What's the path between the process that we have right now and the process that we need to have when we're that size? We have to think about those gaps, and that's really planning for growth and scale. In addition to external factors, internal factors, there's also external factors like regulations that also present challenges to running your business. Because similar to growth, you can't just hit a pause button to plan all the next steps and make sure that your business can comply with changing rules. You have to know how to do this while everything is still going on. And if you look at the first of the bullet points, many of us are acutely aware of discussions taking place by the different accounting standards setters. The convergence project between FASB and the ISB has been and is well underway. And below are just some of the topics that are under review. There are proposals being written, changes being written, and there are drafts which are going out to the public even as we speak. And so that this vision that every company in the world, big, small, private, public, they will all adhere to a common set of accounting standards, that vision seems to be very likely to be completed in the near future. And from a change perspective, if you read some of the feedback that companies are saying about these proposed changes, they're not all trivial. They're not all minor. Some of them, depending on what industry you're in, depending on what business you're in, can actually take a very long time to implement. They're not just something where, with the proverbial flip of a switch, you know, if you just make a few changes here and there, everything will be fine. That's not the case at all. So if you think about what the environment is like for accounting standards and where it's headed, some of these changes require finance departments to really take a close look at their processes today and to see if they can map out what that impact is going to be over the long haul if it's something that's going to be significant. And then that's not just what's happening on the accounting standards perspective, but even in the tax perspective, how every country, they have their own tax agencies and they have their own laws. And not just in the United States, but in all over uh, the globe, like in places like Europe. So in that first bullet point where we talk about the Marketplace Fairness Act, for some of you who may not be aware, that's actually a bill that would allow each state to collect sales tax from large e-commerce businesses, regardless of nexus. It passed the Senate, and it's currently in the House. And if that bill becomes a law, that can have some major repercussions as to the processes for some of these e-commerce vendors. And then in terms of that, right now, the European Commission is taking a closer look at one of the provisions about reduced rates because, again, it has to do with the way that companies are practicing something right now and that they believe that there needs to be a change. And that change, it's not necessarily going to be trivial. It can actually take 
a long time to implement, and it can have a major impact to the way you have to do things. And then even from an internal controls perspective, you know, COSO, for the framework that's used for setting up internal controls, COSO has announced that they're going to make a modification to their framework, given that there's much more usage in terms of how we are using the internet and mobile phones to do business. They feel that it's something that needs to be considered as a part of the risk assessment. So what are the exposures to the company if you have employees who want to use the internet, who want to use their phones to do business? And then what are the repercussions to processes and controls that need to be in place if that's the way the company is going to continue? And then, of course, with internal controls, it's very hard to mention it without mentioning fraud at least once. And just a few weeks ago in the Wall Street Journal, the SEC made an announcement that they were going to be allocating more of their time and resources to going after fraud cases, and that's something which they expect happening later in the year. So given that change is inevitable and requires you as accounting professionals to understand the gaps in your processes today and where they need to be, why should we even be concerned about this? Well, primarily it's because we need to understand what all that business change is going to do to the closed process. So what we're looking at here is a study done by the Deloitte where they said, where are the biggest challenges in your closed process? And wouldn't you know, most of the respondents said that it's manual tasks that tend to consume most of the time. So all of us as finance leaders, we know of some processes that are inefficient. So for example, you have a person doing something manually that a system really should do. It's inefficient, and whatever confidence you have in the process keeps diminishing as your company moves along. Also consider how a manual process with one person outside your office in the cube is one thing, and a manual process with a team of people on the other side of the world who you seldom see doing another thing. These kinds of situations make it hard to have confidence in the quality of the process and the data, and many of us have experienced the outcomes of these manual pains. You get little advance warning of potential issues that are material to your financials. You don't have good visibility into the status of your close cycle. And lastly, it takes lots of effort to see consolidated results. One thing we notice is that when companies deal with the challenges of running their businesses, they end up solving point problems along the way that result in siloed data. Customer data in one system, order data in another system, revenue data in another system, accounting data in another system. It becomes very difficult to have a complete view of the business not just at the home office and for your subsidiaries, but even at a consolidated level. Silo data tends to be a common culprit for the manual tasks that you see during a close cycle. And these types of pains all point to a need to implement a unified system and keep it current as the company grows or evolves. Keeping a system current as a company grows is very difficult to do. So as a finance leader in your organization, what should you consider? Well, it's not surprising, but ideally, you want to get on one system that can handle as many processes and as much of each process as possible. You want one system to record the sales lead at the very beginning, and then track prospects, and then generate estimates, and then book orders, build those orders, and then track the shipping and inventory, and record the revenue and collect the cash without worrying about manually managing handoffs between systems or people. It's much more efficient and easier to get the consolidated view, and you don't have to worry about quality of data falling apart in the handoffs. And then when it comes to multiple locations, rolling up financials across distributed offices. Let's say your company has an office in California, Mexico, and the UK. It's easier if your people are all using the same data and process. And it should be easy to have the same process and controls in place from subsidiary to subsidiary, regardless of what currency they're using or what language they primarily speak in. So that you have confidence from the corporate office knowing that processes are working the same across all locations. And not just with respect to processes, but even metric setting and making sure those metrics are also working across all your subsidiaries. The same report that's used at the home office, for example, should be one that the GM in one of the subsidiaries can use with one system across locations. Build it once and then share it. And as the company evolves, you want to be able to stay on one system. It doesn't help to invest significant time and resources to get on one system and then acquire another company only to have a new system to deal with. Because these new places, they actually never get the new system. They keep using what they're using. And so ideally, you want to be able to deploy a system agilely enough to keep up with the speed of business change. 
But achieving the ideal isn't easy. We know a vision is in place, but why can't we realize it all the time? Well, first of all, implementation, it takes forever because it doesn't start with implementation. It starts with a rack, machines. Then you install the operating system software. Then you install the security software. And then there's another rack and another database, etc. And then you finally get to the ERP software. And then there's customization. Customization is a chore because it takes the most time and expense from an implementation perspective. And for that, let me share this brief story with you, how a customer once told us that there's one field in their customer records that they need for tracking their data. And we were told, Ben, your system doesn't have it. Now, back when I was a consultant, if this were on-premise ERP, a consultant, most likely me, would go away and then come back in a few weeks to do something important to the data structure, and hopefully things would work out. But with cloud software, it was done during the meeting on the fly. So on-premise ERP, it has lots of those types of meetings. We're trying to do just a little bit of customization that seems innocuous, that seems innocent, turns out to be a very major effort. And it's not just one meeting, too. It's multiple meetings. They're iterative. They compound. And they drag down the speed of implementation. But that's why it's such a chore. And then assuming you get past the customization part, then you have this extra layer of permanent overhead that's required. Because the machines that you're using, they need to get replaced every three years. The software that you're using, it's going to need a patch. And then the database is also going to need a patch. And if you have any integrations and customizations, those need to be maintained. So imagine this scenario, where eight guys would go to implement a system for a new subsidiary. And then when that was done, six guys would leave for the next project, but two would stay behind, simply because when you have on-premise ERP, you need someone around to make sure that the system is always going to be up and running 24-7. And then the more you do this, the more you build up this layer. It slows the project down as you go. But meanwhile, the organization is not going to stand still for you. You're growing, you're dealing with regulatory changes, but because the pace of implementation is so slow with on-premise ERP, you keep your one system, one system vision, but you deal with the multi-system reality. So as a controller or CFO with a stake in the financial close process, one of the biggest benefits of having the right system for the ideal situation is to have end-to-end -end visibility globally. And while your accounting departments are closing the books, and issuing their financials internally and externally as quickly and confidently as possible, resources are constantly scarce. And this end-to-end -end global visibility, it has to remain current. Your system can't just work perfectly one year and not the next without consuming significant resources any time a change order needs to be made when you're using on-premise ERP. But with the cloud, however, you will have end-to-end -end visibility all the time because you'll be able to customize your processes as the company changes. And when I talk about change, that goes for your processes that are existing and the ones that are new that you haven't seen yet because they've yet to be created. And then with the cloud, customization, it's feasible in a very quick way. For example, when the corporate controller can simply go into the system and open up a new subsidiary. Your chat of accounts are already there. Your controls and processes are already there. Your customizations are already there. If you have a new currency, no problem. Insert the rates, you're there. You don't have to reinvent or rebuild or redo what's already working for you. Change only what needs to be changed. And then you can do customization to have global visibility all the time with very efficient and scarce resources. Leverage team locally if there's a new process and have it be effective immediately. So with the means to do customization for supporting end-to-end -end visibility all the time, the cloud can enable anyone to use the same single system from anywhere in the world. The cloud, it fits with our priorities, for example. You know, we want to know now. Very real-time data-oriented is what our minds are thinking. Business and financial metrics, we know they can be shown on real-time dashboards, real-time reports, real-time searches. Using the cloud day after day, month after month, it begins to foster this culture and this feeling of availability. And we also want to be mobile, especially if you work in a distributed organization with distributed processes. So imagine a process that starts in Europe, then the document moves to the US for approval, and then it moves to Asia for billing, 
and then it moves back to the U.S. for review or for a final audit. Anyone can pick up the transaction and stay within the system and within the process the entire time. So what's happening is that what used to be feasible and practical only when people sit side by side with each other can now be done from anywhere. And the cloud, it also renders a lower cost of ownership. Because with the cloud, what you're doing is you're subscribing to a service that is a very professional IT organizational service where it's not only cheaper in terms of hardware and software and a better usage of existing resources, but it's also making it practical and possible to deploy and finish an implementation. So for example, traditional ERP projects start out in the US and then it gets to Europe. And then US is up and running and they still haven't gotten to Asia yet. But meanwhile, by the time it gets to Asia, for some reason, it just doesn't seem worth the trouble. And then the home office realizes that they need to upgrade and your team is still in Asia trying to finish the initial implementation. It never seems to be worth the trouble. And then what happens with this kind of situation is that you end up with many subsidiaries for which it never seems to be worth the trouble to roll out a single system across the organization. But with the cloud, it's cheap enough so that you'll actually do the implementation and you'll actually finish it. Next slide, please. Be coming here just shortly. We're having a slight delay here, but it will be here shortly here. And when I allude to software in a cloud, I'm not referring to just any kind, but a specific type, a suite that's in the cloud. Have one system for all your core processes and all your data. Have a 360 degree view of the customer, which incidentally, we've seen a lot of IT projects attempting to accomplish. So if you can start with a single source of data with all your processes, you really put yourself in a strong position to accelerate your closed process. And with a single system that you can customize quickly, take command of your financial operations from corporate for your entire business across all your subsidiaries. And with the ability to customize the system and to manage change that's inevitable, like the ones you've heard early in this presentation, this command can help you minimize surprises and errors since you're looking at everything real time. So run your business in real time at a consolidated and disaggregated level. So that will bring us to the a polling question. Yep, nope, we have our first polling question here. It will be coming on your screen in just moments. Remember, if you are looking for CPE credit, you need to answer all three polling questions. This is the first of three. We do encourage everyone to ask questions using the GoToWebinar box, uh, using the question box in your GoToWebinar panel. We will get to these in the Q&A session. Leave this open for just a little bit. We do ask everyone to answer the polling questions as they are statistical in nature, and this helps us get better results. Thank you, and we'll be closing this down. And now I will turn it back to you, Ben, for the panel discussion. Thank you, David. So again, this commences the panel discussion. And what I'd like to do is to ask our panelists to spend a few moments giving us some background. So going from left to right on your screen, John, why don't you go first and please tell us something about Healing Waters International. OK, thank you. Ben, uh, Healing Waters International is a nonprofit organization that provides uh, safe water uh, to communities that do not have access to safe water. We're uh, generally in Latin American uh, countries, uh, the Dominican Republic, Guatemala, Mexico, but we're also, uh, we've moved into Africa and uh, uh, in Asia as well uh, is coming up um, for a, a solution, a community in Asia. Uh, we were founded in 2002, and we have uh, four subsidiaries uh, that consolidates into one, um, uh, you know, consolidation. Okay. Thank you, John. Uh, Stephanie, please tell us a little bit about HortonWorks. 
Okay, hello everybody. Um, Hortonworks is a uh, just a two-year-old company. Um, so we, when I joined the company, there was literally no infrastructure. Or we had a little bit on um, on the software package. We moved over to NetSuite. Um, this uh, this was instrumental in helping us go through the growth curve that we did last year. As you can see, we went from 45 people to 200 people uh, in about six or seven months. Um, what Ben was saying earlier about having the agility and uh, being able to scale our business, that's been um, really important to us um, and, and our relationship with NetSuite. Um, that's, that's all I have to say on that. Okay. Thank you, John. Thank you, Stephanie. So the first question I'd like to ask both of you, one at a time, what were some of the key challenges when you arrived? So Stephanie, why don't you take that one first, please? So um, when I had arrived, I'd actually been working in hardware. And so I came to Hortonworks. I'd never worked for a software company. I didn't even know what big data was at the time. And I had never been on NetSuite. And um, we were doing our year-end close and audit, the first one of the company. and cutting over to NetSuite um, at the same time on uh, May 1st. So um, I'm just like, okay, well, uh, that's great. And I was able to successfully do that, though. And that was just because, again, uh, everything was pretty straightforward. And um, making the cut over and all the data migration over to NetSuite went pretty smoothly. So I was busy, but was able to actually accomplish it all. And then what did you notice about the business processes when you first joined and in terms of uh, your assessment of whether those are ones that you can continue with? Well, so we didn't have any business processes quite yet. And um, we knew that we were in a really big space. We were in a ramp company. Very big. Um, and so what, you know, we had to just be able to make it up as we went along, literally. And that's what we've continued to do even this past year is that uh, it seems like it was like, well, you try to build a system to handle 90% and then the other 10% is just one-off. But in our case, there's just been so much one-off that our ability to continue to tweak and customize in really small incremental, um, in incremental projects is able to, enabled us to be able to keep track with uh, our growth. Thank you. John, uh, why don't you please give us your experiences on some of the key challenges when you arrived, please? Well, for me, uh, when I came to Healing Waters, we had been experiencing some turnover. And uh, NetSuite, of course, was already in place. And the when I arrived, we had a consultant that was just kind of uh, doing the uh, doing as much as they could to keep things moving and the close process going and that kind of thing. Uh, I had to jump in and kind of self-teach on the uh, on the the whole NetSuite uh, system, and because the consultant really didn't uh, you know understand uh, how to use it, uh, and they had only been there for a couple of weeks. So that was probably the the, uh, the biggest challenge for me is just self-teaching and really never having used a cloud-based uh, financial system before uh, again it was kind of a you know it was just kind of a new look a, a new paradigm in um, in accounting and roll-ups for me uh, and um, you know just learning to use the the uh, multi-currency piece and uh, working with uh, different organizations in three different locations. That does sound like a challenge. And I have to think that the processes that you were noticing when you arrived, uh, were they where you wanted them to be, or was there something you had to do on that end? Well, I think some of the, uh, you know, the, the processes weren't uniform. Uh, I think some of that was lost in just the turnover at the position. And so uh, we had to, uh, I really had to reestablish um, uh, common processes in the field so that uh, we were doing the same kind of things in our roll-up in the closed process. And was there something prior to NetSuite that you were using to have to do all this? Yeah, it, prior to NetSuite, uh, and this was before my time, uh, the organization was using QuickBooks 
and with QuickBooks, each entity in the field would be, each subsidiary would be sending a, you know, data files. Those data files would have to be, you know, reopened in the, the, the common general ledger and uh, consolidated. And so that presented some real challenges in terms of the timing of the close. It took, obviously, extra time to get those files here and then, uh, you know, pulling those files into into QuickBooks and doing the roll-up. Yeah, that does sound like something that would have been um, a challenge to address. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, thank you both uh, for those responses. Uh, the next question I'd like to each both of you as well is, uh, what improvements have you noticed using a cloud-based system? And Stephanie, uh, if you can please take that one first, please. Okay. Um, well, in my uh, my prior experience in the last seven years before joining Hortonworks, we were on a tier one system, um, and so it was uh, on premise. It was difficult. All the things that Ben described earlier in his in his presentation, how difficult it is to implement. It was difficult. With a cloud based system, it's just very. I think because it's you know designed for the masses, it's just very, very um, user friendly. It's very, very um, easy to get around. It's always available, and it just always works. It just always works. I remember when I first went live on the tier one system, um, we the AP module didn't work, and we really could not get AP closed for almost three or four months to find the bugs. And it was just, you know, it just was, it was very, very frustrating. But since I've been on NetSuite, I don't know. I don't think I've filed a single support ticket. Um, we have an internal IT staff, but they don't have any involvement at all with uh, with our ERP. They take care of infrastructure and network, things like that. But they haven't had to do anything for anybody in our ERP environment. And so that's just been wonderful. It's very, very successful. Um, and then the multi-currency, that alone is just something that would be very difficult to manage um, without a cloud-based system. And I know that based on my other experience also. So the fact that the cloud can enable these constant updates of the currency, it's a little thing, but it's just so huge when you're managing uh, multiple subsidiaries. Thank you, Stephanie. And mm -hmm. something which I'm wondering if you can expand upon is, since you first arrived at Hortonworks, um, early in my presentation when I was talking about change, whether it's internal change or external change. Were any of those things going on uh, during your tenure while you were trying to uh, perform your duties as a finance manager? So, yeah, um, you know, when we first started the company, uh, Hadoop and, and distributing Apache Hadoop, I think we just kind of assumed that because it was free software, it would be easily embraced and uh, customers would just call us and get support and we would just rake in all of those uh, support dollars. But as it turns out, Hadoop is pretty complicated to use and deploy. And so it's like, oh, okay, well, I guess we have to build a professional services organization. And oh, we have um, these people that are in multiple areas all over the country, and they have to travel frequently. And so, you know, their ability, our ability to build the infrastructure literally on the fly. Like the decision was made in August. By September, October, we were hiring people. By November, we were running a system. By December, we had utilization data inside of our cloud-based system with people just, you know, hiring, bringing them on board, training them. Um, the travel and customer engagement, just kind of, you know, working all of this in would not have been possible in any other kind of an environment. Yeah, that, that does sound like something that um, would be hard to manage. So thank you for that, Stephanie. Uh, John, what improvements have you noticed since using a cloud-based system? Well, what's been an amazing uh, transition for me is just to be able to have the significant reach and control from the corporate office in real time. Uh, at a prior uh, company, uh, a large protein operation that I worked for at the corporate headquarters, we had six divisions where we had to consolidate and we did not have common ERP systems and so every division was reporting <laughs> in Excel and uh, the, the time, the effort, the, uh, you know, the you know, bringing each of those uh, reports into the consolidation was fairly difficult. Here, when 
when each subsidiary is done, I mean, it's there real time. And during the month, I can see how things are going. And, and obviously, there's a lot of transactions that happen during the course of a month. And you can see things as they're happening. And you can anticipate some of the issues, some of the problems. And so the whole close process uh, happens so much more quickly than what I was accustomed to at, uh, at a prior organization simply because it's their real time. And I can uh, look at things, and I can ask questions more quickly. Uh, I can take actions to correct errors more quickly. Uh, and same with, with Stephanie, the, the multi-currency piece, the way that uh, NetSuite handles the consolidation of those, it just makes things <laughs> very simple. And uh, it's been it, it, it's been great. Um, we've gone from a, a close cycle that was uh, close to a month down to uh, ten days after the end of the month. Uh, we could easily do it within uh, one week, but there really is no need to do that. Excellent. That that's a great experience, John. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. Okay. The next question I'd like to pose to each of you. Uh, what uh, obviously both of you have uh, very seasoned expertise, uh, not just in finance, but um, with different kinds of systems. Uh, so, what would be your advice to anyone considering a move to the cloud who has never used the cloud? Uh, Stephanie, why don't you go first with that one, please? So, um, the. The, the one thing that I did do, because uh, when I, as I mentioned, NetSuite, I was new to NetSuite, and so, and while it was fairly user friendly, and I was definitely able to, you know, get through a close, do some financial statements, um, you know, do things in a in a in a effective way. Um, what I realized is that I wanted to just be able to, that was user friendly enough that I wanted to learn more. So I did a consulting engagement. I started about three or four months after we went live on NetSuite. And I literally got on the phone with a uh, NetSuite consultant almost every day, maybe an hour, um, and would, just would come to him with my use cases and say, this is what I want to be able to do. And not have him do it for me, but just literally walk me through exactly how to do it. I don't really have a lot of the patience for the knowledge base. By the way, NetSuite has an awesome knowledge base, but I, have, I don't have patience for that. I just want someone to show me how to do it. So the money that we spent um, on training me to use things as I kind of knew now what my business was doing more than paid off um, in efficiency and it definitely deferred our need to have additional headcount because I just became very, very adept uh, at using NetSuite very, very quickly. So um, and then, you know, the cloud is just really, it's just very handy. It's just always there. Again, I just repeat, it just always works. Thank you, Stephanie. And would you mind sharing your thoughts as to how quickly you were able to go live after you, right after you started? So let's see. I started with HortonWorks on March 6th, and um, the implementation had been already kind of started underway. Uh, but then the person that was the prior person was the consultant who was leading the implementation. He went on and had a, another position. So then. You know, literally, we went live on May 1st. So that was, what, seven weeks from the time that I walked into the building until we went live on that tweet was seven weeks. And I had never even been on the system. And I, that included full data migration of all of our data. That's impressive. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, mm -hmm. John, what would be your advice for anyone considering a move to the cloud? Well. Um, for my experience with NetSuite, it's somewhat different from Stephanie's in that because we're a nonprofit, obviously we need to keep uh, general and administrative expenses at a minimum. Uh, and so I did not uh, take advantage of some of the, uh, the training or the consulting that was available through NetSuite. So somewhat of a self-teach process. Uh, the, the consultant that was here for a couple of weeks, it was a little bit of the blind leading the blind because the, that person was just trying to get their arms around NetSuite as well. So, you know, I, it, again, I, I felt like it was easy enough and I just had to take each piece 
uh, you know, one by one and, and learn it. I think there's lots of, um, you know, help files there uh, that allowed me to, to try to understand how to use each component, uh, each module, that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, felt like I, I got a handle on it within a reasonable amount of time so that I could continue to, uh, to roll up the financials and close the books. Uh, currency translation was a little bit of a challenge for me in, in the way NetSuite handled it, but uh, once I got my arms around that, um, you know, it, it's obviously very simple. Um, and for me, you know, NetSuite is not a fund accounting system per se, but uh, there were um, reports and uh, processes that were established. Uh, early on that allows me to track the restricted from the unrestricted income. So um, I guess all this to say that, you know, anybody that's moving to the cloud, if you choose, uh, you know, to self-teach, I, I guess you need to give yourself a little bit more time. But I also think that it's easy enough to use that um, it, 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 there isn't a lot of learning curve. Interesting. That that's fantastic, John. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. okay, and we have one more question. Next slide, please. So the last question for this panel, I'd like to ask each of you, how would you describe your experience using a cloud-based financial system? And when I say system, uh, I really mean a suite. Uh, so Stephanie, uh, if you can please tackle that one first. So um, we use NetSuite and we also use uh, several other cloud-based systems. Um, for instance, we use Salesforce, we use Marketo. Uh, ADP actually technically has been a cloud-based system for quite some time. Um, and what we, what I like about it is that we can use the best of these individual apps. You know, there's the option to do a lot of work inside of the NetSuite suite, or uh, you can also integrate with other cloud-based apps um, to kind of customize your own ERP system for your own needs. Uh, in our particular case, the Salesforce uh, CRM capability is very, very advanced. It's very, very evolved, um, and it's also uh, very easy to uh, to um, implement. But having these two things together between NetSuite and Salesforce, we have a very, very robust ERP system that um, you know can handle all of the needs of our business. And so having the cloud-based system, you can literally, um, there's a term that we use in open source, which is called vendor lock. You know, we don't, we're not beholden to one single vendor. We can, and I think that will be good for all of the vendors because there's always going to be this, um, this uh, competitive uh, environment. You know, you go into a tier one system, once you're there, there's no way. It's, it's very difficult to, to escape that tier one and all of the other associated applications. But in this cloud-based environment, if there's a part and part of your system that's not working as well as you'd like it to, and you see another vendor that has a better solution, you know, you can kind of uh, substitute that in and out as needed for your own business. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. And then, John, uh, if you can please describe your experience about using a cloud-based system. Well, this, this has been a great experience for me. Uh, I, would, I would never go back uh, to... Um, a non-cloud-based system. Uh, we also use another uh, cloud-based system uh, that that drives our donor database, and it, it's kind of a contact or relationship management system, and it coexists nicely with with NetSuite. We're able to import that information into NetSuite. Uh, for uh, for all of our donations, all of our project sponsorships, all of the foundation uh, giving and that kind of thing. Uh, what I like about NetSuite and how it's influenced the way we're doing things is 
now that we're on the cloud, we're looking to move other business processes onto the cloud. Uh, we do, we have a lot of project-centric uh, uh, collaboration uh, because we're doing systems at, uh, water systems at various communities and uh, we need our folks in the field to be able to uh, share information with us and we're looking to move uh, a lot of our processes onto the cloud. We're considering Google Apps, we're considering MS SharePoint, uh, I just love the way that um, the cloud works for us. It's always there. I think Stephanie mentioned this. It's just always there. It's reliable. Uh, you don't even think about it. And wherever you are, you have access to it. And that has been uh, a real uh, pleasant surprise uh, in terms of my experience with, with uh, cloud-based systems. Terrific. Thank you, John. Thank you, Stephanie. So that concludes the panel discussion. Thank you, Stephanie and John, for those insights. We will now launch our second of three polling questions. You should see that on your screen shortly here. Also, um, I want to ask everyone if you have any questions, please use the question box in your GoToWebinar panel, uh, and we will get to those right after this polling question. We do ask everyone to uh, answer the polling question as this is statistical in nature as well. We'll leave it up for just a little bit longer and at the end of the presentation we'll also have a short survey where you'll be able to connect with any of the panelists or our speakers uh, if you would like to have a, a direct connection with them. Give this just a few more seconds here and then we'll move on into the question and answers. I'll be uh, closing it down now. Thank you. So in the Q&A, our first question from the audience comes around payroll. And payroll seems difficult to integrate. And the question comes up, how is it in moving uh, data, payroll data into the cloud when you have ADP on one area of your organization and other divisions have a different payroll service? Is that something you could talk to, Ken, and maybe the panel could talk a little bit about their payroll discussions as well? So, John, I know that uh, when we first spoke during our introduction, you'd mentioned that uh, uh, payroll is something that you use NetSuite for. Is that correct? That is correct. So, and, and it has been, uh, fairly straightforward. Um, you know, we did not have to to move uh, from any other system. Again, I, NetSuite is, you know, was established when I was here, but in terms of, you know, using it and um, making updates, running batches, those kind of things, uh, it's just, it's just been pretty simple. Uh, have had no difficulty with it. I don't know that I can speak to all, you know, the the questions or all the issues that, that the uh, uh, that this person is is asking in terms of moving uh, from one platform to another. But I can just say that the experience uh, with using NetSuite payroll service has been pretty seamless. Okay. Thank you, John. Our next question is: You both have different businesses with different business models. Are you able to customize your cloud applications to meet your business requirements? Maybe that's something Stephanie and John can talk to. Uh, Stephanie, can you talk about some of the um, different modules that you've had to use within NetSuite and in terms of some of the different processes that you've had to address? So um, we use accounts payable, and the, the term module is a little bit different inside of NetSuite than like a tier one um, application um, because everything is very integrated. It just, it all, it's not like you have modules that you really have to um, manage separately. Like what entries that you put in one module, it already stays down to the general ledger, so I just want to make that distinction. So we use all the typical um, you know, daily business stuff, accounts payable, uh, we also are on OpenAir, which is the NetSuite application that manages all of our professional services activities. So that's where 
travel and time expense gets collected, and then that comes into NetSuite. Um, and then we've done quite a bit on payments modules, so that literally uh, I probably I try not to cut any ch any physical checks at all. So all of our payments modules um, help us automate. Literally, I can go through our accounts payable, mark things for ACH, mark things for bill pay, mark things for wire, and everything um, is just completely automated. It just takes minutes to pay a bunch of bills instead of, you know, getting the hard copies together, um, typing a check, or, you know, uh, printing a check from the computer, um, giving it to my boss to sign, you know, stapling the voucher to the package, all that is gone. And that has saved us literally hours and hours every month. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. John, um, you'd mentioned being a not-for-profit entity. Obviously, there's certain things that you have to consider that might be different from other businesses. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the customization that you've had to uh, think of when using NetSuite? Sure. Uh, and, and you know, we use uh, what, you, what you might consider, you know, the different modules. Stephanie's correct. It, it, it integrates. Uh, very well, and it seems like you, you know you're not using separate modules. Obviously, we have you know payables and AR, and uh, you know general ledger, budgeting, payroll, those kind of things, purchasing, uh, all of those pieces. Uh, what we had to do is uh, create processes and uh, reporting that allowed us to. Uh, make NetSuite act somewhat like a fund accounting system so that for each project we can look at our expenses and keep those dollars separate from you know, general funds that are available for unrestricted purposes. So we've had to customize NetSuite in such a way that, that it behaves somewhat like a uh, fund accounting system. But uh, everything you know, everything again is 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 fairly seamless. You know, we have the the uh, uh, employee center where the folks from different parts uh, of the organization and in different countries can you know update their you know their expense reports and so on, and those can be seen here at uh, headquarters real time. Great, thank you, John. We have just a couple more moments for a quick question, but. One of the things that has come up is asking around security, uh, being that you're not in control. Can you just talk a little bit around the uh, security issues? Uh, I'll, I'll take this one. So um, there, to, to do the level of security that uh, the, the cloud provides, because it's just it's just automatic. Um, Netsuite is uh, creating an environment for you know, thousands of customers, and so they have to be 100% secure. And because of the size of that environment, they can put things in place and put security measures in place and put infrastructure in place that a company my size, and certainly I'll speak for John as a nonprofit, could never really afford to uh, maintain and put in. So now, you know, things are on the internet. Is it, you know? in general, well, as much as we use our credit cards and we put our personal identification and all of these different kinds of sites, you know, we take a lot of risks from that standpoint no matter what. But I know for sure uh, internally it would be very difficult to replicate the amount of security that, um, that the cloud can provide in that suite. Thank you. Uh, this concludes our Q&A session. I want to thank Stephanie, I want to thank John and Ben for those great insights and discussions. Sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions, but we will work with today's speakers to get them answered for you directly after today's webinar. I have just a couple housekeeping items before we end the webinar today, at which time you'll be prompted to participate in a short survey. We truly value your feedback and appreciate your time to help us continue to deliver great content. At that time, you can easily request a connection with Ben, Stephanie, John, or NetSuite at a click of your mouse. Please join us on Performative.com to continue this great discussion. Just a quick reminder that we will be holding our CFO Dimension Conference August 21st and 22nd in New York. I'd like to personally invite you to this premier event. As a special thank you for attending today's webinar, 
we'll be sending you each a special discount off our early bird pricing. I want to thank Ben and our panelists for their time, and I want to thank NetSuite for sponsoring today's event and making this possible. Now I'll launch the last of the polling questions. In just a second, you should see it on your screen. I'd like to thank this time, as you were answering the polling questions, thank you, the audience, for your time. Again, after we close the webinar down, you'll be prompted to take a short survey. If we can ask you to participate so we may get better, deliver the right type of content and webinar to you, we greatly appreciate it. Also, there you'll have the opportunity to request a connection with our speakers, the NetSuite, or request more information on CFO Dimensions at a click of your mouse. I'll leave this open just for a few more seconds. I want to thank the audience and appreciate everyone taking their time. I'll be closing this down. At that point, it will conclude our webinar. I want to thank you. Have a great rest of your day.